Hi. Welcome to... I'm trying to think what we're doing. We're doing the story of Elisha, aren't we? That's it. Look, that's why I've done those notes. We're on part two, story of Elisha. It's a four-part series. Look at that arthritic finger. It's a four-part series, the story of Elisha. Now, if you've watched part one, which I hope you have, because otherwise part two doesn't seem to have quite the same context. It's 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 been a good story so far, so far. I kind of like Elisha, I think. Anyway, this is from 2 Kings chapter 3 and 4. And I'm, I'm going to tell it rather than read it. But what I would strongly, strongly urge you to do is read it for yourself. Because you can, you can read it for yourself and you can say things like, well, actually, Neil, that's not right. You got that bit wrong. Because one of the things, particularly about being a Baptist, but I think about being a follower of Jesus, is where you can say to people, well, no, I, d I don't agree. And we don't have to fall out. I don't have to burn you at the stake or vice versa, but you are perfectly entitled to challenge me on what I think and what I say, because it's together, it's together that we can discern what God is saying to us. So no one person is the holder of the truth. No one preacher, no one church leader, no one book, no one version of the Bible. Because the translations vary. Some are translations, some are paraphrases. Most of them are somewhere in between the two. And they will be more on one side than another. So it's up for discussion, which is why it's important. And the Catholics get this bit right. It's important that our experience of God also matters. Mm. Yes, it does. But not in isolation. So I talk to other people. I share. I get them to help me discern, well, is that God or is that me? That's why community is important. So there you go. There's your free. That was a free micro sermon. It's probably on something. That's probably got some theological or doctrinal name, that sort of thinking. But um, there you go. So anyway, Elijah has just gone off to heaven in a fiery chariot drawn by fiery horses. Draw your own conclusions. What happens next is a couple of weird things which I'm not going to talk about because I talked about them last time. But what happens next, all of a sudden you pan back because you, you've been focused in on Elisha. What's going on? What's he doing? Oh, look at that. He's going there. And then you pan right back. And across the country, things are happening. Because Moab, right, Moab, which is a country um, that borders Israel, has refused to pay its tribute. And Moab's tribute is sheep because Moab used to belong or, or was conquered by Israel earlier and it says well now King Ahab's dead if you remember the story of King Ahab King Ahab died a few chapters ago he was in a chariot that was fighting he got hit with an arrow and they he said get me off the battlefield they take him off the battlefield he bleeds to death in his chariot while still standing up and the dogs Lick the blood from the ground as they wash the chariot in the pool where the prostitutes wash. A very undignified ending for Ahab. But when the Moabites get wind that um, Ahab's gone, they go, we ain't paying anymore. We're not paying our tribute anymore. So, it's exciting stuff. So what happens next is King Joram, who is Ahab's son, says, well, we can't have this. And he approaches King Je Jehoshaphat. Now, King Jehoshaphat was a king in Judah, which is the southern kingdom, which we talked about last time. And King Jehoshaphat says, yeah, I'll come with you. I'll match you. Every, every um, chariot you send, I'll send. Every, every fighter you send, I'll send. Because my soldiers are your soldiers. They're buddies. And not just Jehoshaphat, because they go, well, how are we going to get there? And they say, well, let's go through Edom. So they approach the Edomite king, say, are you going to join us? Because we're all bordering on this country. And if they're going to start getting too big for their sandals, there's going to be trouble. So how about you join us? So the king of Edom says, that's a good idea. Let's do that, shall we? Let's go and crush Moab. Like you do. So off they trek and they, they, they trundle through the wastelands of Edom. And they take the secure, circuitous, is that a word? Route. And they run out of water. And then they, they find themselves stuck in the middle of the desert in Edom. And they go, has God brought us here 
just so the king of Moab could defeat us? Are we just have we just been brought here to be killed? Now Jehoshaphat. Now Jehoshaphat has quite a good history of God. He's got a good history of checking with God before he does things. He's a good king, well, most of the time. And um, he says he says to Joram, who's the king of Israel. He says to him, "Well, is there any prophets about? Is is there any any people of God we can go and ask what the crack is?" And Joram goes, "Well, there is Elisha. Should we go find him?" And so the three kings go and find Elisha and they meet Elisha and Elisha goes well what, what, why have you come to me we got what, what are you talking to me about this for who cares you and me you've got nothing in common he says why don't you go and talk to your your parents gods you know you seem to love them so much and of course his parents gods Ahab and Jezebel who's still alive um, are the gods of Baal so Elisha's a little bit snarky here and um, they say, well, go on, tell us, go on, go on. And he says, oh, you're going to be all right. He says, you will um, you will go through the land. You will cause all kinds of trouble, the kind of devastation that armies do to destroy the country's infrastructure. It's a bit like Russia's doing with Ukraine. So you'll chop down the trees and you'll throw stones in their fields and you'll stop up all their wells. Everything that you can do that is basically very evil, that destroys country's infrastructure. So off they set again. But he says, before you do that, before you die of thirst, dig some trenches when you camp. And you won't hear anything and you won't see anything. But the trenches will fill up. The pools will fill up with water and you'll be OK. So they do this and Elisha goes off. Now overnight, some floodwaters come in and fill up these, these trenches with water. And all of the humans, the armies and the animals can drink and they're OK. Now, looking out, the Moabites see this first thing in the morning and the sun is just rising. And the sun is rising red. And it's reflecting on the pools and it looks to the Moabites like there's pools of blood everywhere. So the Moabites go, look, they don't kick the camera. They go, look, the kings of... Those three kings of Edom, Israel and Judah, they've had a big scrap overnight. There's blood everywhere. Let's go and finish them off and nick all their stuff. So out they ride. And as they ride out, it's too late because by the time they reach the camp, all of the three armies are ready for them. And they're like, ha ha. And there's a massive fight. It's very Old Testament at this point. A big massacre. And the army are routed. And they run for it, the Moabites, chased by the kings. And they run back to the capital city of Moab, which I can't remember the name of. I'm going to find it. They go to the capital city. Um, oh, does it say? Oh, Ker, Ker Heres. Ker Heres. They retreat to the capital city and then they are besieged by the three armies. Now, the king of Moab looks out over the wall and he thinks we're messed up here. But he obviously thinks of it in a different language. So he tries, he gathers together 700 of his best warriors, men with swords, it says in the Bible. And they ride out to try and meet the king of Moab, but uh, 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 Edom. But he doesn't get far enough. He has to retreat back into the, into the town, into the cities. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't get out. I can't. I, we can't get through. Even with an army of our own, we cannot get through. So what he does is he takes his firstborn son onto the the walls of the of the town of the city, and he sacrifices his firstborn son to their god Chemosh. Now, when the Israelites see this, they are terrified, and they just run for it quite wise a mystery because it doesn't say whether they're scared of Chemosh whether they're scared that this guy will do anything or whether they just think well that that's it Yahweh's going to get involved our God's going to get involved we're off we can't be doing with this sort of stuff and they retreat back and that's the end of that war with Moab but Elisha in the meantime is doing Elisha stuff. He's living on the side of a mountain. And he gets a message from a widow of a prophet. One of the you know there's a group of prophets knocking around. Do you remember the group of prophets? Well, there's groups of prophets knocking around at this point, bands of prophets. 
And the widow sends a message and says, my husband's died and that's it. I got no income and I owe money and the debt collectors are coming around and they're going to take my sons and sell them into slavery. And Elisha says, well, we can't have that. What, what can I do? What can I do? He says, what have you got in the house? She says, I've got nothing. I've got a tiny amount of olive oil. That's it. So Elisha says, go to your neighbours and get as many jars and jugs and cups and vessels as you can. Get them all. And then when you get home, shut the door behind you and the kids and fill up every jar, which she does. So she takes a tiny amount of oil and she fills up a jar. Then she fills up another jar. Then she fills up another jar. Then, and all the jars are filled. And she's got enough money to pay off the debt and to survive after that. Now, Elisha used to travel around a lot. And one of the places he used to travel around to was Shunem. Shunem, I know. I'm not testing you on the names. Now, in Shunem, there's a rich woman whose house he used to stay at. And he used to stay there quite regularly. And she says to her husband, look, Elisha's always here. Can we build him a, a room on the roof? We'll put a wall around it, put a bed in it, a chair, you know, a desk lamp, some reading materials, you know, who knows. So they build Elisha. Um, an extension basically so whenever he's in town he can stay there and Elisha is delighted and here we get the first appearance of Elisha's servant Gehiza who I think I, I don't know why I like him so much but I just like him and Gehiza appears and Elisha has a chat with Gehiza and he's saying well look this Shunammite woman she's so good I mean I know she's loaded he says because she was rich you know she built this house and she built my room and she looks after us whenever we're here what can we do for her he says, why don't you ask her what you want? And she she replies. She says, um, well. I, I, I don't think I want anything. I've, I've, I've got I've got everything I need. I'm with my family. I'm with my people. Um, I, I don't need anything. And he says, well, I could talk to the commander or the king. You know, I can. No, no, I'm fine. She says, I don't want anything. And then Gehiza, the servant, says to her, well, she's, she is, she's got a husband, but she's got no children. Her husband is it's very old. So uh, I, there's not much going on there, he says. So Elisha says, well, get her in again, get her in. So he gets, he gets the, um, the Shunammite woman in. He says, well, this time next year, you'll be holding a baby. And she's like, don't lie to me. You know, you, you, you've seen him. <laughs> she says. He says, but don't worry about it. And about a year later... Despite her doubts, you're a man of God, you're not going to lie to me. Despite that, a year later, she has a son. Now, the son grows up and he works in the family business. He's working in the field. One of the days he's in the field and his head starts to ache and he's taken sick and they take him back home. And he lies down with his head on his mum's lap. So my head really aches and he dies. He dies. And the woman is like, what? So she takes the boy upstairs, puts him in Elisha's room on the bed. And she says to her husband, <coughs> get the donkey. I'm going. I'm going to go. And he says, why, where, who, why? Where are you going? What's going on? You don't even know if the husband knows this has happened. And she says, I'm just going to go. All right. You shush your mush. I'm off. So she goes and on the way, when she starts to get close to where Elisha lives, he sees her come in. So he says, what's going on here? Why is she? God hasn't told me anything. He says, he says to Gehiza, the servant, go and go and meet her and find out what the crack is. So Gehiza goes up and he says to her, what's going on? Is everything all right? You know, you and your husband and your son. And she says, I, I, I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to see Elisha. I'm on my way to see Elisha. So when she gets to Elisha, she falls down and all the grief that's been building up just wells out and Gehiza's like what's up with her get her out and he says can't you see she's upset and he says to Gehiza get the get my here's my staff go to her house and lay the staff across the boy's face and all will be well so Gehiza sets off but as he sets off she says this to him I swear by my loyalty to the living lord and to you that I will not leave you sound familiar so Elisha and the woman follow on after Gehiza. He's already on his way. Now Gehiza goes ahead. He goes to the house. He goes up the stairs into the room and lays a staff across the boy's face. Nothing 
happens. By which time Elisha and the Shunammite woman have arrived and they're like, what's, what's going on? He says, I've tried nothing, nothing. So Elisha goes up the stairs into the room and he lies across the boy face to face, hand to hand, foot to foot. And the boy's body seems to warm up, but nothing happens. So Elisha walks around the room a bit and he's like, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. What? What's happening? Because the Shunammite woman said, look, I didn't even ask for this. I, I have asked for nothing from you and you gave me my a son and now he's died. You've, you've made it worse. And Elisha's, all this is running through Elisha's head. And he's like, what am I going to So he does it again. So he lies on the boy, face to face, hands to hands, foot to foot. And the boy sneezes seven times, starts to breathe again. There's more miracles. Read 2 Kings, chapters 3 and 4. It is remarkable stuff. It's a great contrast, I think, in these stories, because you've got this big event of the war with Moab. The three kings, you know, this isn't just like a couple of people having a scrap. Three kings gather three armies and they, they travel, they journey with their armies through the deserts. There's sieges. There's it's major international stuff that even involved diplomacy with the gods to try and make it happen. And then at the end of that story, it flips. In that big story, Elijah, Elisha just pops up, says, you, know, you should be doing that. And what, you know, what's going on? And then he's gone. It's all about the kings and their great, this great national story. And then the next chapter, it's like, whoa, it just drops. There's Elisha and these human, tragic, personal stories, of personal loss and family life and practicalities of I can't afford even to live. It's quite, I think, quite, quite beautifully told. So do read it. Find a translation or, or like something like the message and read it like you would read a novel, like you'd read a story. And it's fantastic stuff. It's better than Game of Thrones, I think. So there's these three kings riding out to claim the tribute due to one of them. But they make an error of judgment in terms of their journeying. They run out of water. And Jehoshaphat says, well, let's... Uh, Let's talk to the prophets, find a prophet, because that's what he did. He does back in Judah. He should have known better. He should have consulted God before he set out. But he doesn't. And Joram, who initiated the whole thing, feels that God has just tricked them because God's trying to do them it out, which is kind of very much like his parents thought, Ahab and, Je and Jezebel. They're like, well, God, don't worry about God. No good to us. Never done us any good. What's he ever done for us? So it's Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, who reminds Joram, perhaps you should return to God and see what God is saying. So they find Elisha, who is none too pleased about this. He's a bit short and a bit terse, and I think he's a bit snarky. Yeah, go on, go and see your parents, prophets, you know, if you think they're so great. If you think, uh, you know, why, why are you bothering our God? You didn't seem to need him before. So this is partly, I think, the thing with Elisha. I think he is a bit more uh, stroppy <laughs> than Elijah was. And, and it, he's like, well, what, what, we ain't got nothing in common. You're a Baal worshipper and, I, and I'm, I'm a Yahweh worshipper or the Lord God Almighty worshipper. Anyway, he gives the instructions and then this this kind of weird miraculous trick happens with the water when um, the, the first of all they're miraculously fed and watered well watered and then in the morning there's this trick where the Moabites think there's been a fight there's blood all over the field and it's just the rising sun so Joram and the other two kings nearly nearly defeat Moab but not quite because there's this weird incident on the city walls at the end where the king sacrifices his own son and the Israelites are terrified, they're scared and they run for it. Whether they thought the uh, 
the the Moabite God would bring down judgment on them, whether they thought God would be terrified or whether they think that's it, we've won, we've done enough, we're scared, we're not we're not going to do anything else. If this king is going to do this, who knows what he's going to do, or we don't know what God's going to do. Now he's done this. Either way, like much of the Old Testament, this story is as full as more questions than answers. Well, but that depends how you read it, because actually this is the story of God and God's people. It's fascinating. And then the story flips to this, I think, remarkable story, the poor widow and the Shunammite woman. And I do like, I think I mentioned, I do like um, Elisha's servant who pops up at this point, Gehiza. And he features throughout the story of Elisha from, from now on. He's always knocking around, doing stuff and running chores and getting things not quite right. A bit like Manuel, I kind of see him. I don't know why. Anyway, he is at Elisha's side. So the first part, I suppose, is the story of God's provision, isn't it? It's the, the similar stories scattered throughout. Um, then there's even within the story of Elijah, there's similar stories of God's provision. God notices the insignificant people, people who just get lost by the wayside of history, just the small people, people like us. God notices and does something to pull us through. But the person that strikes me the most and I, all this week, I haven't been able to get her out of my head, really. I'd, I'd just been thinking about her and, and what she was like. Is the Shunammite woman another hidden hero of the Old Testament? And when you when you visit a story, when you read a story again, which I'm sure you will. You'll think, how good is she? How good is she? She's brave and assertive. And there's no nonsense with her. She's rich and she's content. She didn't want his help. Don't mess me about. I know what I'm doing. I've got my life together. Thanks. Tell me straight what's what. Get the job done. I like her. She's an unusual woman or it's an unusual portrayal of a woman in the Old Testament. But on the other hand, that's partly due to our cultural training. We're taught that they weren't strong. You know, we, well, we're not taught there weren't strong women in the Bible, are we? They're just not talked about. But here she is, holding up society and her family and doing the things that just get on with it. And listen to what she says. When Elisha says, you stay here, I'll go and sort everything out because he's a man. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'll sort it out. She says, I swear by my loyalty to the living God and to you that I will not leave you. And do you know who said that? Just two chapters ago, Elisha himself said that to Elijah. Because Elijah, if you remember, if you've read it, read it, 2 Kings 1. Elijah says, uh, I'm just going to go over there. Uh, if, if you stay here. And he goes, I swear by my loyalty to you and the living God that I will not leave you. And then he says, all right. And then Elijah goes there and then he says, well, I'm going over there now. Uh, you stay here. And Elisha says, well, I swear by my loyalty to you and to the living God that I will not leave you. And I think he says it three times. So here is the woman reflecting back. So she's like, don't think it's just you. You're not the only one. Who has these these characteristics, this strength of character? I have it too. I have determination and a commitment too. So he's the, the snarker is outsnarked. <laughs> it's good. So what are we to make of these? I think because they are beautiful faith stories. They're stories of God's presence and of God's concern for us. But they're also a mirror for us. Look at Elisha, not the not the big, brave, all-powerful prophet even, which sometimes he comes across as a bit kind of, well, whatever. Things didn't run smoothly. It took him three attempts with a Shunammite woman's son. His servant, he told his servant what to do. It didn't happen. He had to go. Then he's, he's walking about. I don't know what's going to happen. There it is again. 
several fumbling attempts from Elisha before things are put right. We are called by God, but we are imperfect, stumbling humans. And we all get it wrong. We will all fall short. But that doesn't invalidate either our ministry or our calling. And we need to have an openness to God who who works with us and how he works. For me, the star of the chapter is is the Shunammite woman. For me, um, her determination and her practical responses, they're fantastic. And she has survived for 3,000 years. This story is about 3,000 years old, give or take. Not some poor, needy, weak woman in need of the strong hero to come in and save her. But a strong, confident person, sure of who she was and what she was about and determined to get it. She's a hidden diamond, a real person, ready to serve God, to support what God is doing and ready to challenge God when things aren't quite right. In the last one, we thought about taking on the mantle, didn't we? Our own calling, I suppose. How can we be the glory of God? How can we take on that glory? Well, this week, be the Shunammite woman. Be determined, confident in who you are and confident in who God has called you to be and what God has gifted you to be as well. And before the week's out, read the rest of the chapter. There's two more odd little miracles Elisha just kind of they kind of drop out of him as he walks around two more miracles another cooking miracle Um, well two cooking miracles I guess technically so yeah do give them a read but enjoy the Old Testament just kind of launch into it and and read God's story of his people and discover discover people like us hidden in those pages so God bless I'll see you at the next one